So I'm, I'm Ashley Parker. I'm a White House reporter uh, at the Washington Post. This is Tad Devine. He's the former chief strategist for Bernie Sanders. It's Laura Olin. She's a former Obama social media strategist. And that is Jeff Rowe, the former campaign manager um, to Ted Cruz. And I thought I would start by having each of you take about 90 seconds or two minutes and sort of tell the crowd, um, based on this panel, which is paid in social media, a project, either your most well-known project you worked on that is kind of in this space, or maybe one that probably no one has heard about, but it was really interesting or important to the campaign you were working on at that time. Well, I guess, you know, um, the most recently well-known project I worked on was Bernie Sanders' last campaign for president and uh, in 2016, uh, although I've worked on presidential campaigns for a long time, beginning in 1980, believe it or not. Okay, so uh, for President Carter, for Mondale, for Dukakis, and, and for John Kerry, and for Al Gore, too. So I've spent a lot of time working on presidential campaigns, but I think the, the work that my partners and I did for Bernie last time is probably the most relevant to this discussion. So. Uh, and I uh, worked on Obama in 2012 from the before the beginning to after the end. And then uh, four years ago today, in fact, um, I helped launch the Hillary Clinton campaign on digital. I worked on uh, Huckabee in 08 and Rick Perry in 12. <clears throat> and then most Perry people went to Newt for a little while in 12. And then Ted Cruz in 2016. <laughs> Um, and so I very briefly covered political advertising. And back then, the most exciting thing people like you were telling me about was something called addressability, which basically meant, if I'm describing it correctly, that two people, two different people living in two different homes, potentially neighbors, could be watching the same primetime show on NBC. And they could get served different advertisements that were targeted directly to them. Um, that was five or six years ago. So I'm curious, what is sort of the the new, new cutting edge thing, whether it's uh, television advertising or social media that the smart campaigns will be doing and that reporters covering this should be kind of keeping an eye out for? Well, I wish I knew anything about that. I'll tell you, it's really, uh, <laughs> it's pathetic that, you know, because I make TV ads and I do, I, I do strategy, but I'll tell you the little bit I, that I do know, um, just from the last campaign. You know, I think one of the things that we did successfully for Bernie last time was to try to use the tools uh, of uh, voter contact that are available. And I'll give you an example of it. You know, we found in Iowa that we could actually deliver television ads to people who had satellite TV based on the voter file. Okay, so we'd find those people, they became our targets, and we sent them specific ads. If they were in a certain demographic, like people who were 65 and uh, plus or a little older, my age, you, uh, you might get a great Social Security ad that we did. If you lived along the route of something called the Bakken Pipeline, which was this pipeline that was gonna go through the state, we had a great Bakken Pipeline, and we delivered that. So whether it was demographic information that we had about people, geographic information, one of the things that really stunned me when after Iowa, when I looked back at the Iowa caucuses, you know, there's 99 counties in Iowa, they're contiguous. I noticed that we had won almost every county along the route of the Bakken pipeline, okay? <laughs> and I think that ad and that message may have something. I just wish they had a second pipeline going the other way. <laughs> okay. We could have maybe got a few more delegates. But so I think, I think that's what's happening. We're taking all of this data that is coming into play. Not, not me so much, because I don't do it as much, but the people I work with, both on the digital side and also in terms of delivering television advertising. Now, that's a very exciting thing to me that we can deliver television advertising to people. And a lot of the digital stuff we did, I mean, we we had some great five-second ads <clears throat> that we delivered to you know, uh, people who were 17 plus, because if you're 17, you can vote in the Iowa caucuses. And they would show up, and they would get out the vote ads and things like that. And, you know, and, and we caught their attention with it, and we'd go to their phones. So, so I think we're using technology, but you know, I'm still, I, what I do mostly is message, media, and trying to figure out what we're going to say. So. Um, I think on the Democratic side, <coughs> uh, a lot of the spaces that a lot of our target voters are, are spending their time online aren't actually monetized yet. Like there aren't, aren't ads on, you know, uh, a lot of the gaming spaces um, and some of the smaller social networks we, that people are creating on their own, like you know, Discord instances and, and stuff like that. So it's it's going to be an interesting challenge for all these candidates to to figure out how to get into those spaces and interact with people authentically and um, make an effective case for their candidacy. And really quick, are those, like you mentioned, a gaming space? Are those spaces, I don't know, that are open to paid advertise, like that I you think, could pay to be yeah. there? Or would you have to get in in a more organic, social way to have a campaign give I, a message there? Yeah, I think some of them are do have paid uh, options, like Twitch. Um, I'm not actually sure what, what the 
options are for Fortnite. But um, yeah, there's this, it's, it's the wild, wild west right now. So I think, um, yeah, it, it, this cycle is really going to determine how people interact with, with those spaces. So uh, cable in the last month lost, I think it was 1.8 million subscribers. An additional 1.3 million people cut the cord to broadcast. And so the biggest evolution this year, which there's, it's an open market space right now. So going direct to, you know, Fortnite or whatever, if you want to do some in-game programming, um, that's, that's kind of how it's done. But there's, there's some markets that are being developed around in, in, uh, within apps and it's called OTT and OTT is essentially advertising for your smart TV. And so regardless if you're on YouTube or Hulu or where you go, you can advertise to the IP address. Um, if you're watching your MLB app and you're watch your favorite team and they go to go to commercial break, your app actually goes dark. That will be over this year. Um, if you're on um, video within food selection sites like Yelp and all those, they're going to provide all this video. And so the, in the Republican side, a couple of things are changing. One is it's a brand new way to communicate by IP address. That's a game change moment. Uh, two is the, the cable cutters and the, the cord cutters, as we call them, you can, now track, you can now follow them by IP. You can follow them on their phone. You can run. Now the new thing would be you can run a different ad to their iPhone as you could hmm. to, their, to their iPad, to their laptop. And so those things are going to be changing. The marketplace is also not established, so there will be some rampant fraud. Um, at, at, as, as usual at the beginning of an industry, this is a very niche industry that's coming. And so, peop, so consultants, uh, people that sell this are going to lie about it for a while. So it's going to be hard for you as reporters to really understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And so the simple thing you have to do, which I always hate when the reporters do this, so do it all the time, <laughs> is uh, give a couple bucks to a campaign. Give it to all of the campaigns to sign up um, as a volunteer. And that is a way to network in to see what we're actually using to, to advertise. It's very hard to get the IP address removed back <clears throat> to a voter, removed back to potential to vote, removed back to a likelihood to vote for you. So it's going to be blanket advertising. You're going to get to see it all. Hmm. But you're going to have to work really hard to get into these systems because everybody's going to be in until somebody comes in and organizes it and strategizes it and brings all the partners together to share the revenue, it's going to be very hard to track that. Right. And speaking of rampant fraud, um, one of the challenges I always felt as a reporter trying to cover this was every now and then you would get lucky enough and the campaign would bring you into headquarters and show you the digital folks or the messaging folks and they'd peel back the curtain and allegedly show you the secret sauce and say, you know, this is our voter file, this is why we're targeting these voters, these students at Drake University have gotten all of these touches, they've been served 10 Facebook ads and they've, you know, engaged with them this percentage of times and this has led to how many volunteers and how many signups and I often felt beholden to sort of taking their word, and I never knew how to really fact check if they were giving me the right information, um, if they were fudging the numbers they were giving me. So what tips do you have for reporters who are coming in? If they hear something from a campaign, how can they fact check it? How can they gut check it? What are the other resources they should call around to? Is it other mm -hmm. campaigns? Are there mm -hmm. outside watchdog groups to say, hey, does this pass the smell test? Is it possible mm -hmm. that Bernie's campaign could have had this many mm -hmm. touches? What, what should they be thinking about? I think you should do what David Brody used to do, go up and knock on doors and talk to people and say, you know, and see if that's for real. I mean, I, I, think, I think the big thing about the media, I mean, my side, what, what I work on in the media is, I think you guys have a lot of access to information about media buys and, you know, what, where people are buying, how much money they're spending. You know, those services are now available. At least bigger media outlets have access to that. And, you know, that's a gold mine. Okay, I mean, you know, in, in my view in campaigns, you know, and I, I have a, you know, I'm, I, I make TV ads, so I, I'm sort of, that's my, I'm, I'm, that's my focus. But I think that the media buy is the objective manifestation of a campaign's intent. And you can find out where we're buying, how much money we're spending, you know, uh, look at it geographically. You could even look at it demographically, okay? And when somebody gives you, who's on your team, not my team, you know, your team, that data, then I think you go in and you
you ask guys like us the questions, okay? You don't walk in there getting the information from them. You walk in there armed, knowing stuff that your people gave you and ask the questions on I that think, basis. And I could be wrong. I think that is true on TV buys. There's yeah. wonderful services like CMAG and Kantar where they yeah. can tell you what media markets were bought, when the ad went up, how much money was put behind it. Um, it feels like the digital space is a lot more murky because the campaign may have a firm they give the money to yep. and then they, they buy and best I can tell, there's not a way to know how much yeah, was actually spent. On Facebook you can. Yeah, uh, but on some of them. Yeah. So I guess my question is for, for that and to know how many of these ads were, as you were saying, were actually served to a cell phone or to an iPad. Um, what are sort of the the smart questions about that? Um, a couple of resources I would point people to are uh, ProPublica has started tracking um, basically how campaigns are targeting people and um, through uh, web browser extensions and stuff like that. So I would check out them. There's also a group out of London called Who Targets Me that's doing similar work around the world, but also around the 2020 elections here. Um, and then I think, I think uh, Facebook is actually uh, finally bending to the pressure and they're going to be doing some more um, transparency around this uh, this cycle because there's obviously a ton of concern about how funds are being uh, used uh, by various groups. So um, there will hopefully be some reporting from the platforms themselves about that stuff. So the, I would top line, there were 247 working daily reporters working on the White House race in 2016. We called it, what we called was our baseball 500 list which is those 247 people plus about the top 100 donors in the country and then the balance of the 500 were activists. We took the top 20 people in our campaign and everybody got assigned a number of them to contact each and every week. And then we had our Saturday calls for the Sunday shows to make sure that we had our message at least in the, somewhere in the brain stem of either a producer or the host of the Sunday shows. Um, so we are working you as hard as you're working us. I'm not sure if other campaigns did that or not, but we certainly did. It was a, we would have meetings every Friday, and our senior, th these are senior team that have full-time jobs <clears throat> that had to take what would typically take five or six hours a week to really truly just BS with a reporter. And so when, because there's so many people writing stories, um, and because so many of them follow the candidate, which is the worst person to follow, um, we would pitch, because there's not enough content if, you're, if your candidate's doing a good job, they say the same thing every day, so there's not enough, con enough content. So we would pitch a process story once every week. And that process story is what you, I think you're talking about, which is when we essentially feed you as much bullshit as you'll swallow. <laughs> and um, so there's a couple things when you do that, though, and the smart reporters, which, which there's one in the green room, so I don't know if he's after us or before us, but Sasha doesn't accept much bullshit on the sandwich is if we have the, all this technical advantage, then I just want to talk to two people. Here's, the, here's two sets of two people. I want to talk to two people that are volunteers. You say you have a million volunteers. Yep. Just let me talk to talk, two of them. And the second one is I want to, to talk to two voters, just two. You have all these people modeled. Two voters that are not volunteers and that are not donors to your campaign. Uh, that is the thing that I would ask. The second thing I would ask is, what is the biopsy of who you're trying to advertise to? The reality of the, of the situation is, which I don't know if I'm supposed to admit this as a Republican or as a consultant, but the fact of the matter is when we serve ads over digital space, at best, on our best day, we're going to land 71% of them. And on our worst day, it will be in the 30s. So we take this list, all this consumer data and 50,000 data sets on every single voter that we have now. It's all publicly available, not publicly, well, yeah, you buy it, it's publicly available. Um, then we lay in the, the, the um, political data that only political parties can get, so that's a little bit of stuff that you can't get. But, and then we go out and make about 20,000 phone calls per state to pull these people into a model. And these are the Cruz voters and Trump voters and Rubio voters and Ben Carson voters and whatnot. And their likelihood to vote for each. When you're covering a Democrat primary, they're going to say their likelihood to vote for everybody. But somebody made Mayor Pete go from 1% to 9%. So if they're pitching how they're, blow, how they're blowing their team out and they're hiring all these people, don't follow stats on, on mm. staff hires. It's, it's, it's almost in, inverted on, mm. on the application. That will tell you maybe how much money they have. But really bad campaigns hire a lot of staff too early. The day that Rick Perry had the terrible story that he lost seven staff, 
and it took him down to three staff in Iowa. Ted Cruz had one paid staff. Mm. So just, you know, a poor application of po politics doesn't really lead you to how people are targeting. But to wrap it, what I would say is try and talk to real people. Don't follow the candidate all the time. That's rarely where the news is made. Most people in the campaign are probably assigned to talk to you. And so find out who that is. It might not be the campaign manager. It might not be somebody, the senior strategist, that you want to talk to. But we're the worst ones to talk to because we're the best at feeding it. And if you're an embed, build a relationship with somebody that's on this, in the senior staff level but that, 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 um, that will be more candid with you and share more information. And the way to do that, it ought to be like a reporter's bill of rights. Don't tweet. <laughs> Stop tweeting. <laughs> because it's like a truth serum. And so if you're covering, I'm sure there are Republican reporters. Um, I don't think I've met any, but I think there are some. <laughs> um, if, if a Republican reporter is tweeting ever, and retweeting all the bad stories about a Democrat candidate, you're probably less inclined to talk to them. And so if, when you're on the trail, don't expose yourself. Don't stay past midnight, nothing good happens, your mother was right. <laughs> and build a resource in the campaign that will last the length of the campaign and don't shoot too high. Don't think that the campaign manager is the only person to talk to. Yeah. And, and speak, I mean, I think the baseball 500 list that you were talking about is fascinating because this is about how campaigns are targeting and trying to influence voters, but there is also that element of trying to influence reporters to write the stories you want, to wave them off of the stories you don't want, to write the stories trashing your opponent that you do want. If you guys could just talk a little bit more about the ways in which your, your campaigns uh, or you personally have tried to influence reporters mm -hmm. and sort of what they should be mm -hmm. aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny when I hear Jeff talking about that, I realized Bernie, we did, you know, <laughs> we, were just, we, just, you know we, we were just trying to get through the next day, right? You know, in 2016, 2015. But, but I felt, and it's probably one of the reasons I no longer work with him, I felt it was very important to speak to the press, okay? And, and you know, and, and I would do that by returning phone calls to people. And I found as the campaign started getting going, I had a lot of incoming, you know, and I would have to work day and night just to try to return everybody's phone calls. And, and you know, and sort of my, sort of technique on this is, you know, I feel like, okay, I've got some valuable information that if I, that some of which I can share, some of which I cannot share, you know, because if I share it, that's going to be a bad story for the campaign. So I don't want to really put that out. But, um, you know, I feel like I should be giving that information out systematically. And usually what I would do is, and sometimes we would do this in an organized way. We'd have a couple of your reporters come in and sit down with like Jeff Weaver and, the, and I, you know, the campaign manager. And we would say, okay, here's what we're going to do in the next two months, or here's why we're doing this, or here why, you know, and they'd write a story about it. And we thought that was really good. But most of the time, it would be that I would just call up people and, you know, or they'd call me and then I'd call them back and I, and, and I would explain what we're doing. And I always try to explain it in terms of a much bigger strategy, you know, that we do indeed have a strategy, you know, and that this strategy can result in victory. And, it, and a lot of times it depends on, you know, who you're working for. When you work for, you know, when I work for Al Gore, who the incumbent vice president of the United States, who was the front runner in a race, the conversations are very different than when you work for a democratic socialist who's an independent running for the democratic nomination. You know, you've got to, you know, with, with Bernie in 2015 and 2016, the conversations for the most part were about you know, with people I've known in many cases for many years, we're like, are you kidding? You know, that would be their question. This is a joke, right? You know, and, and, I, and, and my answer was, no, it's not a joke, and here's why. And, you know, and I would, and I, when, I, when I told people I, we were going to try to raise 40 50 million dollars for New Hampshire, you know, way back in early 2015, they were, you know, they were incredulous, and they weren't serious. But then when we began to do things, like, for example, this is, you know, and the end of the filing deadline, September 30th, 2015, you know, we had a reporter from the New York Times come to Burlington, sit with us during the day, watch as things came in. And, you know, lo and behold, turned out we raised $32 million, which was almost as much as Hillary Clinton's $36 million. So we would occasionally open things up and let them in. But mostly what I would do is, and I think it's really important, I would tell people what I knew, you know, as much as I could without, you know, going too far. I mean, I think, you know, different candidates are different. You know, Al Gore would very much want you to speak to the press as much as possible and to explain almost everything. But if you said the wrong thing, like, you know, I remember I was at the vice president's house one Sunday morning and George Stephanopoulos went on TV and he, he said, well, the Gore tracking polls say blah, 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 blah. And Gore like, freaked out, you know, in front of like 20 people and everything. So the meeting was over. I said, excuse me, can I have a minute with you, Mr. Vice President? I said, yeah. I said, I was the one who gave Stepanopoulos the numbers, okay? Why 
would you do that? Because they think you're going to lose. That's why. Because you're 10 points behind Bill Bradley in the Boston Globe poll. That's why. You know, and so, so you have this back and forth dynamic sometimes within campaigns. Mo some, most of the time, you know, they want that flow of information. But when you give a little too much, you know, and that's why I sort of have a rule. I basically speak on a record almost all the time, 100%. You know, because then if you want to know what I'm saying, you can read about it. It's right there. So. Um. Uh, whenever I talk to someone who's running for like a local or state office, I, I basically tell them that real people don't use Twitter, like, um, and that really the only reason to use Twitter is to interact with reporters. Um, so there's a new data that came out just yesterday from the Pew Internet Research uh, Group that I think 21% of, of U.S. adults are on Twitter. So it's it's down like below like Pinterest, below Snapchat. Um, so uh, generally, campaigns look at Twitter as a way to uh, influence press stories, obviously. Um, so, in terms of how to do it, uh, you can see people like Elizabeth Warren, I think, is doing a pretty good job this time of, of setting the policy conversation, um, just like dragging it back to housing policy, child welfare, um, by just, you know, putting big uh, ideas out there and, and uh, leading to, like, discussions of them and, and all that. Um, and then, generally, uh, campaigns will do a lot of work uh, behind the scenes to get people with large followings to, um, share content that they've created. Uh, I, that hasn't really happened too much so far in the primary right now because it's so early, but I'm, I'm sure that'll continue um, going forward. So yeah, it's, uh, just know that it, um, pretty much it's, it's the space where people are trying to, <laughs> trying to um, uh, mold your opinions of the campaign. So all of these Democratic campaigns, their aides are, are tweeting out photos of huge you know, fisheye yeah. views of crowds on Twitter. Should reporters mm -hmm. assume that that is geared for them more so than Yeah, I think it's also, um, like obviously like no one wants to join a failing campaign like as a Fair. volunteer <laughs> or as a donor. So I think it's, it's, it is for, for reporters for sure, but it's also, you know, like especially on, uh, in the era of small dollar grassroots fundraising, you know, like so much of what you're doing is telling people that like you're, you're basically creating a club that you want people to join and no one wants to join a failing club. So um, yeah, so crowd, crowd shots are, are definitely important for the press, but for everyone else too. And um, yeah, and you, you see that with like the, the fundraising numbers that have come out and like the number of donors and, and, and all that as well. Um, and so I think at least as of a couple weeks ago, the Trump campaign, I believe, has spent more on Facebook advertising than the entire Democratic field um, combined. And I'm yeah. curious what, what you make of the reasons for that and if you think that's a savvy investment for them or if Democrats yeah. are missing an opportunity. I mean, uh, very unusually, the, the president launched his re-election campaign, I think the day of inauguration. I don't know if, if anyone's done that before. So he's had two years to raise a bunch of money and um, uh, run Facebook uh, ads. So um, uh, uh, so just two things I would say is, one, like all Facebook ads and other social media ads are not the same. So they usually have one of three purposes. Um, uh, acquisition, which is just a fancy term for getting people on your email list. Uh, email is still by far the driver of small dollar donations and volunteer signups. Um, second is persuasion, like actually getting people to care about your candidate um, or not care about another candidate. And third is mobilization, like actually getting people to turn out for uh, uh, elections. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to look at like just like giant numbers and, and really assess from there like whether it's savvy strategy like I know people, um, I'm not myself a paid social media expert, but like people in the space do find it really concerning that, that uh, our field is so hard, far behind. But um, it's obviously it's early, we're only like three or four months in on the Democratic side. So as fundraising picks up, like I'm, I'm sure we'll see that equalize a little bit. Uh, I think it's very smart. Uh, when these numbers are reported, and I think, um, I'll say two things. I don't want to forget the second one. So the second one's going to be about how to work a campaign staffer. But <laughs> The first one is when, when they report the overall Facebook spend, exactly right, there's acquisition cost, which it costs about, I mean, it, it depends on your day. I can only speak on the Republican side. But anything over $2 is a little bit too much to spend for an email. And anything under a dollar is like you're not spending enough to get them. You need to spend more and more and more and more. And so in-feed Facebook advertising is becoming a very good place to get emails. <coughs> Because you send people to a landing site, they have to sign up to get, you know, sign the sign the um, pledge to build the wall or whatever it is. Uh, the other thing, though, that's happened for Republicans, and I can't speak to Democrats again, but is in 
Facebook feed fundraising, literal fundraising. And so that's moving. People are signing up on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising, text fundraising. This just started last cycle. It's, we're now close, closing in on Democrats on being one click. And so when you see those numbers, and they always report it like, Trump spent 189000 this week, and Elizabeth Warren spent seventy-seven, and Castro spent $0.76. Cents. That, is a, that, that is a measurement. But it's really not the measurement. The measurement is how much are they of that are they spending on fundraising, acquisition, and how much are they spending on persuasion. And so that's what I want to say. Second thing is when you guys are covering, you've probably, I mean, I love embeds for a lot of reasons. And it sounds like the <laughs> biopsy here is the, and, and I love the embeds. I don't know what party they belong to. And people that were embeds last cycle are now well known, you know, becoming more and more known. Um, People in politics work typically for 10 or 15 years to get to a situation where they have any sort of climate control on a presidential campaign. So a lot of times when they come in, when a reporter comes in to hear the theory of the case of how you're going to win, you, if you agree with the theory of the case, instead of making that first conversation a freaking argument, it's probably the best thing you can do. Because if there's a theory of the case of how a candidate has to, how a candidate can win, which we have to make every day, even the front runners have to make, but for sure with Cruz and certainly with Sanders, they have to make it. You make this case, and then the reporter wants to like argue with you about it, like how that's not right and that doesn't make any sense. And well, Rubio's people said this, and just give us the moment here, man. <laughs> <laughs> just let me tell you how when I wake up, I think that we're going to win. Just like get it said. But also the listening to it, you know, there's a lot of people, reporters predominantly, that when you introduce yourself to them, they don't really, they're not thinking about their name, they're thinking about the question they're going to ask, so they forget your name at the end, or they'll forget your email that they just, that you just gave them, or they don't take down your cell phone. No, normally they get the cell phone. But when you follow up and you say, okay, the theory of the case for Ted Cruz is that he's going to go coalesce evangelicals and Tea Party, and then he's going to get libertarians when Rand Paul drops out, and then he's going to take George Bush to the finals, and beat him head to head, you know, in uh, in Wisconsin. You probably don't need to talk about Donald Trump at that time. See, <laughs> well, how are you going to handle Trump? So there's a there's a story of the day in a presidential race that dominates the reporter's ability to work their to work a campaign. The story of the day that everybody's chasing. What are you? What's your reaction to Trump's tweet? Or what's your reaction to what? you know, the stump that Beto stood on today, what's your reaction to this and that? Instead of using that time to develop it, I, I know that you have to burn and churn on a story every couple of days, but using that time to follow their theory of the case and listening to it and then following up with them, is, it's, it's rare, it'll set you apart, and it'll also make you smarter when you actually see that their theory of the case is falling apart. Yeah. Um, and Laura, you had mentioned earlier about email is still king um, for a number of things, including raising money. And I'm curious mm -hmm. why everyone thinks, A, with sort of society's obsession, campaign's obsession, and certainly news organizations' obsession with all other forms of social media, why email is still that main, most effective driver. And if there's any hope that this cycle, that a campaign will crack that code to find another way to use other forms of social to kind of turn on that money spigot mm -hmm. for all of you. I mean, it's, it's funny because on the Republican side, it, it does seem like um, a, all the reporting out of 2016, like uh, they claim to have raised a lot of money on Facebook um, and Democrats raised some on Facebook, but um, it's just, it's like a drop in the bucket compared to email still. Mm -hmm. I think it might just be some structural things about, um, you know, like the place that grassroots campaigns have in the history of democratic politics. Like it's, you know, we've been doing this for 15-ish years. Um, and it's kind of how our people expect to give to a campaign and um, be a part of it. Um, so I think that very well might change. I think another challenge for Democrats that I don't see talked a lot about is that um, you know our our uh, target audiences are like young people, people of color, um, women, and um, all those people are scattered like all over the internet ecosystem. So um, you know, like we're not all on Facebook. Like you know, it's it's just. It's a little bit of a more fractured environment for us to figure out how to reach people and 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 the best way to do that. So, um, yeah, I'm actually. It's funny because you know I've been doing this for probably about 15 years now, and like 
you know, every two years everyone's like, email's gonna die this year. And it just never <laughs> happens. And it, like, yeah. people who actually do this for a living are as astounded as, as anyone else that it that's, remains true. I think one thing that also could be useful for you all to look out for is, um, uh, back in 2012, um, we had about a million people on our SMS list and mm. had some luck in raising money um, by through one-click donation technology. And um, 2016, uh, people, people seemed to use um, texting mostly for the volunteer coordination, which right. I think was pretty useful. But I'm really curious to see whether um, people are going to really use text as a, a major fundraising driver, because yeah. um, it's a, kind of an unexplored territory. And I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and you mentioned this brings me to another question about sort of the Democratic voters are scattered, scattered all across the internet. I'm curious in terms of, you know, I was, I was talking to some campaign people and they were saying like one of their, for the Trump campaign, one of their key voters is sort of like a low propensity voter who has maybe only voted once in the past four years and they're not a Democrat or a Republican voter, they're, they're a Trump voter and that's who they're trying to target and that's a very different profile than a coalition, a Democratic campaign is trying to build and I'm curious when it comes to reaching these different voters, are there places where it makes more sense and where reporters should be looking for Democratic campaigns to be playing in a space and where it makes more sense where a Republican campaign might have better luck reaching, reaching their sort of core audience? Yeah, I can take it. Um, what, an incumbent president just has a built-in set of advantages that, that, that a Democrat who wins, assumingly somewhere in March, April, or May of next year would have. And the fundamental advantage is, is a ground game mm -hmm. and a, a, a network, both paid and unpaid, of people to actually go churn these votes up. They also have the advantage, which C3s will do this on the Democrat side for, you know, and outside groups will do it, but voter registration also, to register voters to, to, to participate who never participated before. The Democrats will be essentially really confined because they'll be very hard to create in a very short amount of time. They'll be confined to doing so in a voter contact way, non-doors, non non-in-person. They'll do some of that, but they'll rely on outside groups to do that. Mm -hmm. They'll rely on the teachers unions and the, and the you know, C3 and C4 appropriate activity for, for voter contact. Uh, the Trump campaign in the, in the new kind of five bellwether states, watching how they build their organization will be a key to seeing how well they run their campaign in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that the, the, the President Trump does from a donation standpoint works. Everything works. Texting <laughs> works. Facebook works. Mm -hmm. Search works. Like he's the biggest fundraiser on the Republican side, small dollar in any measurement of history. Um, even amortized, you know, with, with current dollars online. And so they're going to be doing a lot of that online, but I would not be sucked into that persuasion. I would view the Democrat nominee and their persuasion opportunities through social media, and I would watch that m much more closely than I would watch what the Trump campaign does. I would watch what the Trump, Trump campaign does on the ground and their serious investment mm -hmm. uh, on the ground. To the ROI, the reason why email works is because of the return on investment. So the ROI on an email send is somewhere between, I'll just say a neutral, white, 55-year-old male candidate running for some office. So an ROI on a piece of direct mail from a campaign is about you know $3.11 for every dollar you spend. To phone call, people still give just on the phone, is about a buck fifty per dollar you spend. An email that you send is between seven and nine dollars for every dollar that you spend, and until that ROI comes down, there are some people that will only go, give in the mail. Unfortunately, there are some that will only give on the phone. Unfortunately, but until that ROI comes down, I don't think I think we will be lazy enough to not try anything else. Hmm. Is part of why the innovation is not going to not going to catch hmm. up to anybody. Um, and then going back to messaging, in 2016, mm -hmm. um, Bernie did this famous America ad that felt... Yes, um, I remember that. <laughs> it, 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 I don't know if you guys know, he, he can describe it better than yeah. I can. I'll let you do that. But it just yeah. felt so different than a lot of the yeah. ads we were seeing on TV. And I'm curious right. if you could talk about, well, first describe the ad for those who yeah. don't know it, but talk about the thinking behind it, mm -hmm. um, why you think it worked. Mm -hmm. And if I recall, Bernie doesn't really appear until almost the end of the ad. And that, that in theory, yeah. to have your candidate not be there was a risky strategy, why you thought yeah. that was worth it? Well, listen, that was a very unique circumstance when Paul Simon says you can use a piece of music, okay, that presents it. Now, and, and, and it's funny the way that happened. One day, I got 
a call from Bernie. He said, Todd, I just had lunch with Paul Simon. He wants us to use one of his, one of his songs. I said, great, you know, <laughs> fantastic. What is it? He said, I am a rock. And I, said, I said, listen, that's a really bad idea. Okay? Said, why, why? I said, you know, I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one and no one touches me. I'm a rock. I'm an island. That's too close to the truth, okay? We don't want to go there. <laughs> but I did at least, well, you know, maybe. The song, and, you know, we were batting things around, my partners and I. And, you know, we were talking about different songs that we might use. And actually, one of my partners' wife, Margie O'Mara is a pollster, and she had suggested to Julian, well, you know, why don't you use America? And I was obsessed with this whole socialist thing, you know, like, <laughs> well, you know, and I, I kind of really pushed him to give a speech at Georgetown about what democratic socialism meant. So I was like, America, what's better than America? We could, you know, so, so I started making this ad, and, uh, you know, and it's true, it didn't have a lot of burning, you know, but we had the soundtrack to, you know, America, and we laid it down, and we're putting images on it. We had a lot of images from the road because we had a crew following around, so I started making the ad, making the ad, and it, you know, and everybody's liking it. And, you know, and then, I, and then we did this great town hall meeting that we filmed. Three cameras, lit it for five hours. It was beautiful. It was like Hollywood, right? And Bernie had this great thing about why don't you join our cause and things like that. So I had put that in at the end, and I went to Vermont and showed it to Jane, his wife, and 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 Jeff Weaver too. And they and, and they both said, you know. I think it's better when Bernie's not in the ad, you know? <laughs> and, I, and, and, yet, and that's when I realized that ad was not about Bernie Sanders, it was about those people, you know? So, so I started putting the ad, basically it starts off in Iowa and, you know, goes along, and then it's all these scenes with people, and you see Bernie intermittently, he and Jane are in there a few times, and then at the end, I started getting, just put in these scenes of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger crowds. You know, and, and I'll tell you, by the time the campaign was over, actually, we, it wasn't just me who made that, my partners, a lot of people worked together to make that. We had 10 versions of that one ad, okay? We had the Iowa America, we had a New Hampshire America, we had one out west. The last one I made, I was, I live on Block Island half of the year, and I, I phoned it in, but I had them, you know, because they were going to use it to introduce Bernie at the convention, and I had them put in a scene at the end where, you know, our, our slogan was, you know, a future to believe in, and her slogan was stronger together. So I had the last scene, a picture of Bernie and Hillary, and it said, stronger together to build a future to believe in. Okay, I was trying to, it's like gunshot wedding kind of, but I was, you know, to, I was doing the best I could. And, you know, and so I think that ad, it did resonate powerfully. You know, the New York Times used it as an ad to Lynn Favarek, who is, you know, from UCLA, used it as a baseline against every Clinton and every uh, Trump ad, and won every ad test. And I think the reason it resonated is because people are looking for, they, they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to come together around something they can believe in. You know, and you know, they want uh, to be positive and forward looking. And, and I think that's why it resonated so powerfully with people. It's not your typical political stuff. We didn't have any, you know, the only words there were, I'm Bernie Sanders and I proved this message. Okay, that was the only time we said anything. So, so I, I think there was a lot of space for that. And, you know, and that was something that we tried to use to our advantage. And I think it was one of the big reasons we closed the way we did in Iowa. So. And, and still on messaging, um, there, just to give you an example, there's this Democratic ad maker. I am kind of blanking on his name, but I think it is Mark Putnam. And he makes these beautiful yeah. ads. Um, and he did a bunch of ads of these red state Democrats, um, Begich and Landrieu and Heidi Heidkamp, and, and they were wonderful, almost mini movies. I remember right. the Begich one has a little like airplane in Alaska taking off over the wilderness. They were just what I thought when I was covering advertising was great ads. Um, you may notice all three of those names are no longer right. members of the US Senate. Yeah. And so I'm curious, how much does messaging matter and how much can it sort of compensate for and how much does the candidate or the on the ground reality or the the wave matter like how much should reporters be thinking about messaging in an ad actually being able to put their candidate over the top and how much is it a pretty video that got everyone voted out well of I, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in, in, in it being about the message you know and that the ads are a device to deliver the message. So, you know, in, in my view, I mean, sort of the, what I, what I, when I think about ad making, I think there's these three circles. It's almost like Olympic rings, and they, they overlap in the middle there. And, you know, the first circle is authenticity, and it being real and authentic. The second is emotion. And if you can find emotional contact, and, and, and Putnam, I mean, he's a great ad maker and does that stuff extremely well. And the, th and the third is storytelling. 
You know, you have to tell a story. Now, the story that we tell is usually 30 or 60 seconds long. Sometimes it's, it can only be five seconds online, and it, sometimes it could be five minutes, and that's where we really, we did a lot of that for Bernie. We made very emotional videos about people's lives, and strangely, many of them were African Americans or Latinos who were for him, and we were trying to, you know, make that connection as powerful as we could. Occasionally, you get into that little sweet spot in the middle where it's authentic, it's emotional, and it tells a great story that people can remember. And, you know, but I think really it comes down to having the right message, you know, and, 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 and I think, you know, if you've got the right message and you deliver that message powerfully to people, you can move them. Voters will be persuaded by it. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what the message is. And, 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 and I think the, the visual elements of, of advertising are really, really important. I mean, that's what I do, and I'm always looking for powerful. Some, I did John Edwards' campaign for the United States Senate many years ago, and we had him standing in front of a water tower, you know, in front of Robbins, you know, the tower, tower was, and, we just, and that whole campaign was about keeping him in front of that water tower tower, physically, visually, but also metaphorically. We could never lose that little town that he grew up in and the values that he shared with the people of that state if we were going to convince them to get rid of an incumbent Republican in North Carolina. So, so, you, know, so you know, having the right message. And I believe there is a winning message out there in almost every campaign, and there are for Democratic challengers in this event. And the task of finding it, you know, I believe a lot in research. Bernie didn't want to do any polling. You know, he said, you know, I, and I tried to convince him to do polling. He said, Todd, go with your gut. That's what I do. You know, and it's like, and, and, I, and I said, listen, that's why I admire you and I respect you. But your job is different than mine. You can stand up for an hour and 15 minutes and tell everybody what you think about every issue under the sun. And I get 30 seconds. And I want to, and also, we have to buy media. And if we don't know who the targets are, we're going to waste all that money that people are giving you by hitting the wrong targets. You know? so, so everybody's got their role. So, but, but I think if you do get to the right message and you deliver it powerfully, authentically, emotionally, you tell a story that people remember, you will move them. And that's the task, I think. And do either of you have anything to add on messaging? Or? Uh, just real quick, I would say um, you know, one of the disparities that we often see is you know, what's been talked talked about in the media and on, on Twitter, where all of us live, versus uh, what candidates are actually uh, talking about on the trail and um, what, what people are bringing up at town halls. So there's like a huge um, difference there. Like, you know, in, in 2018 for the midterms, like, you know, people were talking about impeachment and blah, 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 but like people on the trail just wanted to talk about healthcare. So um, don't get sucked into, uh, you know, like the just like the insider bullshit that someone many of us traffic in every day, um, because so, so much of it is just like what are what do people actually bring up um, as they're interacting with these candidates? Yeah, the message is everything, hmm. and um, all the rest that we talk about, we obsess about, and I personally obsess about it. And part of my career has been based in, you know, trying to magnify. Um, it, it's all like a field goal. In a in a game that that's you know going to score 100 points, that could come down to a field goal. Field goals win a lot of games. A ground game, a strong ground game, ground game, peer-reviewed academic research can give you a 2.5 to 4.1 advantage over your opponent if they don't do a ground game. You know, a, a delivery of a message is very important and can can really create efficiencies for a campaign. But nothing nothing beats a message, right. and nothing beats the ability to convey it in a very artistic way. Uh, that's appealing to voters and it inspires them. And so a lot of things a lot of people will talk about, it's almost like the, the working press will just say, oh yeah, they ran an ad. Instead of what was the framework of the ad, what, what is the, um, go talk to voters about the ad. Um, I know we're getting ready to take questions, but the last thing I would say from that standpoint is that really go talk to voters. Um, don't watch somebody else talk to voters on like a Fox, <laughs> You know, not that anybody's watching Fox in here, but um, just kidding. Um, not on some Franklin's focus group or something like that, but actually go talk to voters. Tom Hamburger really almost like broke our lock on in in, in Iowa, and he said, "I'm going to go out and walk doors for 25 minutes." Mm -hmm. And I thought, "Holy shit, where's he walking? Can we get somebody in front of him? Right. Can we put like <laughs> stickers, like stay away if they're like you know Trump voters or something? Like that's a scary proposition. Is when you actually go talk to a voter, a reporter talks to a voter that has communicated with your campaign, and you haven't communicated well with them. That's a terrible moment for a campaign. So I'd encourage you all to do it a lot, since I'm not running <laughs> one this year. Uh, and 
Um, Lori, we talked before, but you're, you were not a member of the paid team. Your expertise is in organic social media, mm -hmm. and especially and on the first, I mean, can you sort of talk, uh, explain a little bit more about what that actually means? And then especially uh, on the Democratic side this year, where it feels like so, so much of the questions and the enthusiasm is around uh, small dollar donors um, and volunteers and kind of creating a movement and an organic movement. Um, what role should that play and will that play in Democratic campaigns and what should reporters be looking for in, in that space? Um, yeah, so social media is obviously it's a really important place to get out your message in, in various ways, and um, but it's also uh, uh, a really important infrastructure building tool. So. Like any campaign is um, looking to raise money, they're looking to recruit volunteers, they're looking to turn out voters, and social media is, is a way to um, get people in the door principally. So a, a lot of our job on 2012, and I think um, the team felt this way in 2016, was um, social media might be the first and only place that people interact with your campaign before they decide to become donors or volunteers. So it's sort of the, the first level of um, what we call the, the ladder of engagement, where you get people, someone in the door, maybe it's on social, and then hopefully they sign up for your email list, they start getting emails, asking them to do progressively higher bar actions. So um, donate $5, become a recurring donor, come out to this event, um, come to this rally, and then finally knock on doors and talk to people, which is by far the most valuable thing that anyone can do for a campaign. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, I think we're, we're definitely not as good at the message part as Republicans are. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested and really hopeful <laughs> that uh, people um, crack the code on that this year. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, like, it, is, it is a tool. And especially um, <coughs> Democrats are trying to reach younger people, and younger people um, are hard to reach. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how people get into these new spaces and, and smaller spaces because I think we're seeing generally like the era of like what I refer to as broadcast social, like Facebook and Twitter. It's it's everything's getting smaller. Like Facebook groups are kind of uh, even Facebook itself is putting more emphasis on groups over like larger newsfeed stuff. And then um, people are f forming like slacks and discords and, and all these like smaller spaces to interact with people. So it's yeah, I think it's it's a obviously changing all the time, which makes it interesting. And very quickly, we're about to move to questions, but one final question. Um, often covering advertising, it feels like one of these internal campaign wars that breaks out is between the TV people and the digital people. Mm -hmm. And the digital people are happy to tell you how the TV people are all crooks and they're taking a huge portion of the ad buy and that's the only reason they want stuff up on TV and they're enriching themselves and not helping the candidate. And the TV people will tell you that the digital people like are reaching no one on Twitter and they don't know what they're doing and all that Snapchat mm -hmm. stuff is a waste of time. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could just sort of like Talk about this struggle, why it exists, and what each of you thinks is the right breakdown in terms of a campaign's <laughs> budget for that yeah. piece of the pie. I think 100% TV in, would be my in, preference. But, in uh, our remaining two minutes. You no, know, I, listen, I, 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 that's true. You know that there there is this. You know, it, it's very hard. How do you? You know, someone is telling you, listen, the only way for us to win this is to go in and to get on TV and move this TV, and that person is getting commission on every TV ad that runs. You know, it, it, you know, and 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 you know, my view is, I really believe that TV is very powerful. You know, I was reading a book on the, on the way uh, uh, here that described the, what these three serious academics looking at Iowa you know, in 2016 came to the conclusion, which was when we went on TV in Iowa, the whole thing started to move. And when we moved to Iowa, the whole coverage for Sanders began to change nationally, OK? I believe that's what happened. And, and, you know, and, and I think television advertising is still the most powerful way to affect <coughs> vote because the people that television advertising reaches are the people who are going to decide elections. They're not hanging around looking, you know, reading their news feed, following every development in the campaign, knowing how much money everybody, they're living their lives. They're working really hard. Some of them have a couple of jobs. They've got to do all kinds of stuff. Their kids take care of And then you can get to them in this place, in their home, where you can, if you get their interest and attention, you can persuade them. But, but, but I believe, you know, as we go along, we're doing more and more, you know, we make content for digital too. And, and I, I think that's, that's a great thing to do, but I don't, think it has replaced television yet. I still think television advertising is the way you can, if somebody came to me and said, okay, listen, you get $10 million to run a presidential campaign in Iowa and New Hampshire, but you have to make a choice, spend it all on television or spend it all on digital. 100% of the time we spend it on television. And do either of you want to 
call him a crook and take the other side. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so much of it is like, who are you trying to reach? So, like, um, if you're trying to reach like older people, like they watch cable news more than younger people. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're trying to reach, you know, a certain like Latina voter, like she's probably spending her time online or, or uh, consuming TV in, in different places. So that's the that's the first question to ask, and it's going to be different for every campaign, I think. The problem with TV, I completely agree with I, both. So I'll just briefly say. What's lost in this is the efficiency of the communication to the voter. Mm -hmm. If you're advertising in the Quad Cities, 64% of the money is going to go to Illinois. Right. If you advertise in Council Bluffs, 70% for Republicans is going to Nebraska. And so the efficiency of this, which is why, which then creates new ways. So, okay, then are we going to go on satellite and addressable and all the things? It's all about the efficiency of the dollar. So if you had 10 million bucks, I'd say it takes $36 to persuade it takes $27 to motivate. How many votes do I need? And what's the most efficient way to deploy it? And it might actually be 100% one way or the other. I'd rarely be in a situation where I wouldn't run TV unless my candidate was 100% known and 100% um, had a, an opinion of them one way or another. And then I would just motivate, spend all money motivating. But in presidential campaigns, there's a lot of persuasion, big Senate races. Um, big governor's races, it's persuasion, so TV is, the, is still king yeah. and will be foreseeably future, foreseeable future. Got it. Um, and if people have questions and want to line up there. Uh, Andy Shane with the Post and Courier. Um, you had mentioned, Ashley, a couple of sites to, to monitor um, media buys. I think some of you all have mentioned. Could you, do you mind going over those again, either, whether they're paid or whether they're free, just to, especially the Facebook buys and that kind of thing, just to be able to keep track of that? Uh, I'll start very briefly, and then these guys know more. Um, the one, and this is your news organization, at least last I checked, had to pay for a subscription, was CMAG Cantar, and that literally captures every single, it will like deluge your inbox, but you will literally get an email every single time uh, the campaign goes up with a new TV ad. Um, it is wildly, wildly expensive, and so a lot of news organizations are not doing it, but that's worth asking your news organization if they pay for it. Um, I will say, at one point when I worked for the New York Times, they paid for it for two cycles and then they stopped paying for it because it was very expensive. And so what I was able to do, and this was not quite as good, but I got someone who, who basically did this for a living, um, who was willing to give me like my own backend login um, on their system that tracked where all the money was going at least. Um, and so I would know when, when there was a buy, when stuff had been reserved, which campaign was doing it, what state, what district. Um, so I'd say if you, it was incredibly helpful um, and very cost efficient. And if you can get a source or cultivate someone who has access to this at these TV firms, these media buyers, these digital folks, that's another kind of backdoor way in. Mm -hmm. And then the two that I mentioned for Facebook uh, w was ProPublica and then um, Who Targets Me. Um, and uh, I, I would also just keep tabs on what the government requires Facebook and Twitter and on all the rest to report publicly. And a real quick follow-up. Um, Jeff, you had mentioned the idea of volunteering or giving a little bit of money to each campaign. Is one more effective than the other? Would you suggest doing both in order to get on mailing lists, in order to get ads at you, that kind of thing? Would no, we won't send many ads on email. So you would, Sunlight Foundation will tell you what we spend um, in the top 50 markets, which is all you probably need. Uh, maybe not, but mostly what you need to cover. I'm not, no, we don't have any in South Carolina, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, how do you get, yeah. so, how do you get that sense of, uh, again, I'm trying to get Of what the campaign's what, doing? Yeah, yeah, sign up, yeah, sign up, sign up. You're gonna get a lot more there than you will anywhere else. More effective to volunteer, more effective to give that buck or two. Volunteer. Okay, thank you. And, and can I just ask, would there be, to the campaigns, would there be like an ethical concern if a, or a conflict if a reporter signed up to volunteer and then, like at what point can they not show up at a phone banking headquarters and would you be upset to find out that he was in your headquarters making calls because he wanted to get an understanding? Oh no, I don't think, he, I mean to sign up to volunteer, I don't mean actually volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be no, clear. No, I would be upset. I will kill you and your family. Yeah, all right, yeah. so we're all in agreement. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, that would be, yeah, that would be an executional event. <laughs> Hi, my name is Renzo Roof. I cover U.S. politics for Swiss newspapers. Could you please talk about a little bit how you treated foreign press? There are always these huge camera crews mm -hmm. from all around the world following mm -hmm. the candidates. You tend to ignore them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, the reason we ignore them is, you know, we don't, there's no voters, you know, that you're talking to. I mean, we want to talk to voters through the press. Now, having said that, I, you know, I think there are opportunities to have really good back and forth with foreign press. I'll give you a couple of examples. Buttigieg, who's running, gave an interview in Norwegian, and it impressed the hell out of everybody in America, okay? So, so you know, that's, that's a unique opportunity. Secondly, substantively, that could be a thing. So, for example, if I were doing a presidential campaign right now, I might advise a candidate to sit down with someone from Europe and to discuss the threat America faces by having a president of the United States who believes NATO is not something that we should be giving you know, a, a part of like we used to be, or our relations with our closest allies are deteriorating. So that, you know, because that information is not necessarily directed towards your audience, it's gonna come back to the voters who we're trying to influence here. So, so you know, I mean, the, the reason you don't get much time is there's so little time and there's so many people, you know, who have, are, you know, are covering the race that we have an opportunity to talk to voters through them, and we're gonna take that opportunity first. We attacked our opponent all the time with, with foreign press because we, they would take stories that we couldn't get other, anywhere else. Now, we didn't allow our candidate to talk much because he necessarily wouldn't differentiate um, like what reporters he's talking to, but we attacked all the time with the press. So if you want an outlet, if you want to be that kind of stuff, you can ask the Guardian about that. Um, you, there is an opportunity to be, it has to be verified and you have to do your work and all that type of stuff, but I'm just saying that we use it a lot to attack our opponents. Just a quick follow-up. The Democrats abroad primary didn't pay any role in communication strategy? No. No, it didn't. I mean, it's just, it's not that many delegates. I mean, we, we won for Bernie. <laughs> we were touting it, and, you know, but, but it, it's, it was inconsequential in terms of the thousands of delegates, the handful that they elected. So. Hi, my name is Ezra with uh, NBC. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the social media, the smaller, um, the smaller worlds, the smaller kind of conversations, especially Discord, um, things happening on gaming platforms, Twitch, stuff like that. Do you have any ideas from your perspective how you all intend to try to break into those spaces? And on the flip side, how can we as journalists try to break into those spaces ourselves, see what's going on with that messaging? Um, these are new spaces, pretty unregulated, unmonetized, like, like some of you said. Um, but as we've seen in the past, very influential. So yeah, um, yeah any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so I, um, I don't really expect like Kamala Harris to set up a TikTok account or anything like that, but um, <laughs> I, hopefully not. Um, so I think what, what uh, maybe to, something to keep an eye on is um, basically like digital community organizers and that kind of thing, like people just trying to do behind the scenes or in these forums, like some outreach that way. I think maybe the best, maybe the easiest way to get in would be to cultivate sources who are um, in political spaces in, um, in these, these places already. Uh, the, the, you know, like the smaller like WhatsApp groups and stuff like that, I think is just kind of Im impossible to know what's happening there, um, uh, other than just like anecdotal, uh, you know, quotes that you, that you um, get from people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really tough because like, you know, they're small and, and a black box by design, but um, yeah, the bigger ones, it, it might, might benefit just from cultivating people who use those spaces a lot. And then just to follow up on that, there, I mean, the other side of this is influencers who are just a little bit more public conversations, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, whatever, Snapchat. Um, is that an area where campaigns are thinking, I mean, partnering with, with these people, like you, like you said, trying to push that message out, getting people to retweet certain things from the campaigns with the emergence of influencers, especially on, to, the, to the young demographic. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the campaigns are looking at, like partnering with people who have huge followings, doing guest appearances. I know we saw some of the stuff with like Between the Ferns. All that, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but there's been some of those moments, but is yeah. that going to be a major part of what we're seeing in the future? Yeah, I would expect that to continue. Like when YouTube was the place to be, oh, President Obama did a, a ton of stuff with um, YouTube influencers. And I think we'll see more of it on Instagram uh, this time because um, it's basically like where younger people spend their time um, in, in any large quantity at least. So yeah, I would, I would expect to see a lot. Uh, I think uh, the Hillary campaign did a lot with people like Tyler Oakley, who's huge on social everywhere, and, including Instagram. But um, yeah, that'll definitely be an ongoing strategy. Thank you. One big Friday festival. <laughs> Joe Ferguson with the Arizona Daily Star. This question's for Jeff. You said- Here we go. Press. Here's the public, here's it comes. <laughs> <laughs> 
So have you ever advised a campaign to not talk to a local outlet? And if so, why? Um, have I ever advised um, a candidate to not speak to a local outlet? Yeah. I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine what it would be. Okay. Probably not. And if, if that, what would you advise reporters that have been frozen out? Um, well, I would try and go negotiate with the campaign, or like literally frozen out. I mean, yeah. I just met a guy that I froze out of a campaign once. Um, <laughs> you might meet two. In the, was that? You two? You might meet two. Yeah. Oh. Um, so there's probably a reason, right? There's probably a reason. I'm sure you're blameless. Um, but um, I would go sit down. I mean, it's a human, this is a hu very human spatial relationship um, business. And um, if, there's a, if there's a disagreement, then we do this all the time. I mean, I don't actually, on the back end of camp, I can't, I can list maybe five times that I've called a reporter after an engagement and a story ran that I didn't like. I mean, it just kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot on the front end, a lot of back and forth, a lot of clearing it. And then there's a lot of what we always call the turn the punch bowl call, which is where the story's written, I'm gonna give you a chance to quote, you're going to be in the second to last paragraph, and like it's all done. You're on deadline. It's at 4:45, and you're running a 1,200 word story at 4:45 on a Thursday. Like you probably didn't start it at noon. And so that's the problem that happens. Is so most most campaigns just like we'll run it without us then. There's no reason to comment. Okay. And if there's two or three of those strung along, like we know when stories start. Like you know we watch you know, TV shows. We watch the newsroom, and so I figure out how reporters work. Just like you guys watch, just like you guys watch House of Cards and figure out how we work. Um, but, but we know when a story starts because it's such a small group. I know when an when a, when a entity is writing a story about a campaign, like everybody talks. And so when it comes finally, and sometimes we'll say, okay, well, let's jump out and try and like massage it or change it or whatever it is. Let's show some facts that might impact the story. Um, but when you come with the turn the punch bowl call at, at 15 minutes before deadline, what, there's no reason to work with anybody and, like that. And can I also add something very briefly to that um, about a reporter getting frozen out? So this happened, I was covering uh, Trump for the New York Times. This happened to a Washington Post reporter where I now work, but she was my good friend and I was aware of it at the time. Her name was Jenna Johnson. Um, and at some point during the campaign, the Trump campaign, I can't even remember the offense, to be honest. I think it was a headline, um, which, which is actually something that campaigns get furious about. Uh, but anyhow. She got banned from attending events. They literally would not let her in uh, to rallies or to events, which is 100%, frankly, a campaign's right. Um, and so what she did was every single, she didn't stop covering the campaign, of course. So what she did was every single event, she would go. She would go to the press registration table and try to check in. Um, and she was always turned away because she was on this blacklist. And then because these events are also public events, um, and you can't do this in a pool situation if they're only bringing a small group of reporters into a diner or something like that, but especially with Trump and most campaigns, they're public events. She would then go get in line um, and stand in line and attend the event that way. Um, with Trump, of course, this often meant because he had huge lines, she would have to get there. Um, it was kind of a huge headache for her. She would have to get there. you know four or five hours sometimes in advance to make sure that when she was in line, she would actually be able to get into the rally. But I would argue that it had a tremendous upside for her, her reporting, and the post reporting, because when she was standing in line, one of the things she was doing is what everyone up here said, which is actually talking to voters, um, observing them, being a part of them. And by the time she got into that rally, she had a very acute sense of the fact that Trump may have said something on an Access Hollywood tape that the media was flipping out about, but the 50 people around her in line you know, were either cheering him on or didn't like that language, but didn't really care. And that's one of the reasons, I would argue, the Post was one of the few news organizations who, had, if you read their coverage, had a pretty good sense of where Trump was headed. So that's just one example, but a way that you can be banned, you can still cover the campaign, and frankly, it can enhance your coverage. Hi, Betsy Klein with CNN. Jeff, you mentioned earlier, for those of us covering Trump in 2020, we should be following how they build their ground game in those five bellwether states. I'm wondering, how would you define successful organization for the Trump campaign? Uh, how many, um, so how many non-paid staff are at a headquarters by month <clears throat> leading up to the campaign? So there's gonna be paid staff, like typically you set up, a, and I'm not, I don't have any, 
you know, news here, but in a typical organization, you have an RPD, a regional political director, they hire a certain number, typically five to eight political directors under them that are paid. And then you will have managers, this is how we do it, I don't yeah. I'd love to know how you guys do it. Same but, way. <laughs> um, and then we have about each one of those political directors can then manage probably another less than 10, more than five um, area managers. And so that's the pyramid. Area managers normally are unpaid. Uh, RPDs and PDs are paid. And so you can really tell how, how big the system's gonna get by the paid staff. But also how many people are at the headquarters. I was always, although you did go on, in your reporting, but I'm always surprised out in these states that they won't go to campaign offices. They won't go to the local regional campaign offices and go walk in the door, schedule a meeting and ask to meet there. There's no, you know, there's just not a lot. We had an office in Iowa that you should just roll it. They could have just rolled into mm -hmm. and rarely did they. They always want to talk to us or be on the bus or be in the tag bus behind the bus. And there's not, <laughs> no news there. And so the best way to see is see the infrastructure they have built and then how many people are not paid working on the campaign. That is a sign of a, of a healthy organization. Mm -hmm. Hey there, I'm Kara Cordy with CBS. I'm wondering what y'all think of the mockery that uh, came with Beto and Warren doing these kind of straight to camera testimonial, more casual um, videos on their social media. And if that's kind of just mockery that's hap happening in the Beltway when their supporters actually find it to be relatable and likable or if, if their followers as well think it's kind of embarrassing, the casualness of it. A uh, funny thing is that um, they, like, I saw like a, a story today claiming that, that Beto had like live streamed a dental cleaning, but it was literally like a second of it wasn't like a it wasn't like he was like sitting there with his mouth open like for 20 minutes. Like um, so, it's weird that like how these myth, these myths are um, perpetuating, and I'm I'm would not call myself a Beto supporter, but um, so yeah, like um, I, I I honestly think that there there are some moments that um, might go too far for some supporters, but. Uh, and especially this early in the, in the campaign, I don't know how strong people's affiliations are, um, like how, how tied they feel like their personal um, you know, set of values are to a certain candidate. So it's, it's really hard to say. Um, and I think uh, you know, the standard that like, Twitter has or people who um, are living this stuff day to day have is, is very different from uh, what most people or most supporters or even most voters, like probably most of them don't care um, or think it's charming. So yeah, I, yeah. I think we're right. more cynical than everyone else. Quick follow up to that. Do you think they're doing that in part because of how the president uses Twitter and he's, he's sitting right behind it and he's speaking directly to people? Do you think they're trying to do that in their own way? Yeah, I mean, like even before Trump, like, you know, authenticity is like something that like, I think we all recognize is really important for a candidate to to be able to project. So um, yeah, and you know, with the prolifer proliferation of ways to be authentic online, like I think we're going to see a lot of people try and fail, um, mm. especially uh, you know because the rules were not written around how to how to do it well. Um, but yeah, I think you know, Trump being really good at Twitter um, is probably spurring people on to to figure out how to, to be more authentic, but it's, it's, been, a, it's been a challenge um, forever, I think. I would say just one thing about it is this bubble that we all operate in, on the best night, on the best cable news night, at the highest watch shows, on the, literally with nothing else going on in the world, you might have eight million people watching out of 325 million people. I mean, that's about, like right now, on the big three cable, it's 1.5 million people. And we watch this stuff and hang on these words and it actually, nobody else, I got the teeth cleaning thing. I mean, that was pretty funny, but it was after the campaign, so we didn't get the chance to mock it. <laughs> we wanted to win, because you know, not win the presidency, but win, win the nomination, because you want to beat the best, and then they become the best, and blah, blah. But, I mean, it's a, this vacuum like, just kind of stays there. It all happens in this perpetual loop, and it actually doesn't impact voters much outside of it. Big things will be identified early in this echo chamber, but the small, the, the most heavily watched by the industry, Morning Joe and all that, like there's people, like 
There's more people on this block than in the entire country watching Morning Joe. Like, that's like true. I mean, it's like nuts. <laughs> And so when we talk about that kind of stuff, I'd just be very careful not to follow the loop, right? The signal or the noise. I'd be careful not to follow it. It will be an early identifier in what Mika said and Joe says has impact because the people that do live on this block are very influential if you're watching them because you start your day with that type of thing. But I just be careful about being in this loop of like what's really getting mocked because I, there ain't a voter in Iowa that's seen that. Yeah. Not one. That's not a volunteer for a rival campaign. Thank you. Um. All right, well, thank you three. For